welcome everyone to this installment of the virtual lecture series at the Frontier Culture Museum here in Stanton, Virginia. My name is Doretta Sobolewski and I'm the research coordinator here at the museum and I am delighted to have Dr. Adrian Hood with me today and Dr. Hood will talk about the, dy the dynamics of regional cloth production and consumption in early America. Adrienne Hood began her career as a professional weaver, after which she obtained a doctorate in American history with a research focus in textile production. For over a decade, she was curator of North American textiles at the Royal Ontario Museum, after which she moved to the history department of the University of Toronto, where she taught early American history and material culture. Her books include Fashioning Fabric, The Arts of Spinning and Weaving in Early Canada, published in 2007, and The Weaver's Craft, Cloth, Commerce, and Industry in Early Pennsylvania, published in 2003. She has also published numerous articles about early American textile production. Thank you so much for being here today, Adrienne. It's a pleasure. My pleasure. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Before we start with your presentation, could you just tell us a little on how you got interested in weaving and then researching textile production? Uh, yes, I was... Um a child of the 60s uh, and was very interested in, in weaving and spinning and uh, took a lot of lessons. But what I learned early on was that while people were very interested in doing things like wall hangings and art textiles, they didn't really understand the technology involved in, in actually making a loom work. So I was very fortunate um, to be able to meet and work with uh, master weaver Norman Kennedy. Norman had been the He's a Scottish weaver who learned traditional crafts in Scotland and then became the uh, master weaver at Colonial Williamsburg. And Norman and I worked together over the years. I met him at a, at a um, event in Toronto. It was the first World Craft Council called In Praise of Hands and suddenly realized here was somebody who understood the history, who understood the technology and understood production weaving. And over the years, we uh, worked together, we taught together at historic sites, and I got interested in doing reproductions of historic textiles, which uh, landed me at the Royal Ontario Museum, where I met Dorothy Burnham, who um, people interested in textiles know, wrote a seminal work on Canadian hand weaving, in which she described the different ethnic traditions uh, of hand weaving that existed in Canada. So I, I got then interested in doing a curatorial work. The collection at the Royal Ontario Museum is wonderful. I went back to school. I did my degree in early American history and then became the textile curator at the ROM for a long time. And I was researching uh, textiles. One of the projects I'd done was traveling around to historic sites and analyzing and reproducing uh, hand-woven pieces for reproduction so that uh, with the specifications for that for use in historic sites so that people uh, could uh, understand how to make pretty accurate reproductions. Um, and uh, I was curator of textiles for a decade and then moved to the University of Toronto where I continued to teach uh, early American history and material culture. My research has always been in textile history, textile research. So I've done a lot with hand weaving and also on quilts. So uh, as objects, I'm extremely interested in what textiles can tell us about the past. So that led me to uh, my research projects. Very interesting, yeah. Excellent, I look forward to hearing you talk. Happy to, uh, happy to do it. So uh, shall I begin now? Yes, please do. Okay, I think we're set up. So um, in my talk today, I want to outline some of the dynamics at play in regional cloth production and consumption in early America, focusing on the mid-Atlantic and in particular Pennsylvania over the long 18th century. This was a period of transition and movement as Europeans left their homelands to migrate across the Atlantic, bringing the tools and traditions that helped them to get established in the new world. And it was the particular environments in which they settled, situated within a wider Atlantic context that ultimately determined how they structured their cloth making enterprises 
and the textiles they consumed. I began the research for my book, The Weaver's Craft, Cloth, Commerce and Industry in Rural Pennsylvania, by examining the prevalent view at the time that the women of self-sufficient rural households produced the cloth, the cloth they needed for their families. Though there is some truth in this interpretation, it obscures many of the social, regional, and economic complexities that determine the structure of cloth production in early North America. As uh, Doretta said, and I, we were discussing earlier, prior to becoming a historian, I worked as a weaver researching and weaving re historic reproductions of 18th and 19th century handwoven textiles based on a close analysis of extant items from a variety of collections of museums and historic sites. And this is just um, a page from that project. And it shows that some of the 19th century, shows some of the 19th century linen bed ticking I produced with instructions on how to weave it to replicate the original. And there were also slides of the original. Over the course of this undertaking, I came to understand the labor, skill, and time needed to produce a piece of cloth, the numerous pieces of equipment required, and the gender division of labor often involved in the work. This experience informed my subsequent historical research, causing me to question many of the simplistic assumptions that had come to be associated with our understanding of early American textile manufacture. Although in the 18th century, most people would have been familiar with the tools and labor involved in cloth making, by the second half of the 19th century, industrialization had moved textile manufacture from the household to the factory, and gradually Americans began to romanticize the spinning wheel. Rather than a tool of drudgery, it became an icon of the industrious colonial housewife celebrated in poetry and art. This page from the 1876 centennial edition of Harper's Magazine captures this concept perfectly. Indeed, uh, it may even have helped to create it, as does the work, uh, the artwork of Thomas Eakins around the same time. The New England spinning wheel thus became emblematic of colonial American cloth production more broadly, and with it, the importance of women's work. As it did so, it negated the regional disparities and the complexity of pre-industrial cloth manufacture. To help write the balance, I did a deep dive into the raw materials, the tools, the skills, and the training required to make a finished piece of cloth in 18th century America, and discovered, for example, that textile production in Pennsylvania looked remarkably different over time than it did in New England. Not only did my research involve an examination of qualitative evidence, but it was only with a quantitative analysis that I could assess the pervasiveness of textile manufacture and consider whether or not most early American households actually had the ability to produce all their own cloth. This kind of painstaking research is most feasible through a micro history so my focus was on one county in Pennsylvania, Chester County, and this map helps to situate it in relationship to the Chesapeake. My research was greatly facilitated by the fact that the county has a wonderful archives and historical society containing a great trove of sources, such as household wills and inventories, tax lists, account books, newspapers, correspondence, and artifacts. And here are just some of those. My ability to quantify data was based particularly on a database I created of textile related items from a sampling of almost 1300 after death inventories that listed household and agricultural goods of deceased residents over the long 18th century, beginning in 1715 and ending in 1830. Uh, another source of quantifiable ta uh, data was, were tax lists. And for comparison pur purposes, I sampled a smaller number of inventories from Essex County, Massachusetts. In addition, Chester County, first settled by Europeans in the late 17th century, in some ways represented the heterogeneity that came to define America 
with immigrants arriving from England, Wales, Germany, Switzerland, and Northern Ireland. Many of these new colonists came from parts of Europe where textile manufacturing was beginning to replace agriculture as a primary source of income, and they brought their craft skills with them. In Pennsylvania, land was abundant, but labor was in short supply, unlike in Europe at the time. Many newcomers established a system of bioccupation through which they combined craft work with farming. Chester County's fertile soil and moderate climate meant that farmers soon produced a surplus of goods that they sold internationally. And when combined with income from craft production, they participated as both producers and consumers in the newly emerging Atlantic economy. Though I concentrated my analysis on a single county, it was not unique, as over time, people moved out of that region into places like the Shenandoah Valley, which, not surprisingly, developed a similar economy by the last third of the 18th century. Among the products of the mixed farming of these reg regions were the raw materials for textile production. In the North and Mid-Atlantic colonies, the fibers used to make cloth consisted mostly of flax and hemp plants and wool from sheep. Uh, cotton growing needed the warmer climate of the southern colonies and other than on an experimental basis, silk was not viable in North America until later in the 18th, 19th century. Flax and hemp known as bast fibers produce a very long strong fiber and wool is much shorter. The principle of yarn for production is analogous for all fibers, given that they require twisting to create threads suitable for making a textile. But each requires a separate set of tools, skills, and labor, in addition to which the various steps involved in making yarn were often gender specific. To encourage the colonists to glow, grow flax and hemp fiber for export to Britain for manufacturing into finished products, the British offered a number of bounties over the 18th century and published several treatises on flax and its management. In Chester County, these fibers had been cultivated from the early years of settlement, at first for local use, but by the middle of the 18th century, a great deal of flax was raised for seed that was exported to Ireland for the burgeoning linen industry. And in turn, the colonists became big markets for Irish linen. In fact, by the last half of the 18th century, flax seed was Pennsylvania's third largest export after flour and bread. The seed also produced linseed oil, so flax was never grown solely for fiber. Hemp was not as pervasive as flax in Ch Chester County, though in some regions of Virginia, it became an important commodity. This chart shows the quantities of flax and hemp in Chester County households over the 18th century. Here we can see that even at its peak around the revolutionary period, fewer than 40% of households had flax fiber and only about 15% had yarn. Part of the reason for this was the profitability of flax byproducts and the labor intensity of producing yarn, suggesting that it was often more cost effective to buy imported linen cloth or buy it from a local weaver than to divert the resources to producing it locally. Raising and processing flax and hemp required horticultural knowledge, an investment of time to make the requisite equipment or money to buy it, and a substantial amount of labor to turn it into yarn. And all of that work had to occur within the cycle of the many other labor and time intensive agricultural activities of Pennsylvania farm families. To make finished yarn, the steps involved were similar for both flax and hemp, and it could take well over a year from the planting of seed to produce fiber suitable for spinning. Pennsylvania flax fields generally raised in size from a quarter of an acre to an acre and a half, 
and farmers usually planted them in March and April. The flax was ready to be harvested near the end of July or a bit later if it was going to be used for seed. As you can see from the image on the right, the plants had to be pulled up by the roots, sorted into bundles according to length, and stacked and left to dry for two weeks. This work was not gender specific and could be done by men or women. Once dry, the seed had to be removed in a process called rippling. And in the image on the right, you can see the men pulling the stalks through a rough comb. The seeds dropped onto a winnowing cloth so they could be collected for future use. After the seed was removed, and usually right away in the fall when the weather was still warm, the outer bark had to be rotted to expose the fiber, a process called retting, that was usually done by men in the busy harvest season. There were two ways to manage this activity. Water retting involves submerging the flax in a pond or pool of water. This method was the quickest. Rotting occurred within a week or two with this method. But preparation could be time consuming and it required a lot of skill and access to a pond or other source of water. Moreover, once completed, the water was so polluted that according to one 18th century commentator, it killed fish. Dew redding, spreading the flax in a field for a period of 20 to 30 days, was the most common method used in Pennsylvania as it required less expertise and labor. However it was accomplished, once redding was completed, the stalks had to be fully dried again and could then be stored until there was time and or the labor to process it further, which might then might occur during the less busy period from late fall to early spring at a time when there was less to do and wage laborers might be available to assist in the next step of flax dressing. There were three more steps required before the flax fiber was ready for spinning, each with its own equipment. Breaking the plant to loosen the rotted outer stalk, scutching or swingling, which removed the bark and separated the fibers, and hackling uh, or combing the fibers to align them for spinning. This slide shows the apparatus needed for flax or hemp dressing constructed mostly of wood, though the teeth of the hackle are made of forged iron that could be provided by a blacksmith or purchased as imported goods. And here you can see what it looks like to use the tools. In his 1765 treatise, Hemp Husbandry, Edmund Quincy suggested, and I quote, that as the use of the common hemp break is a laborious exercise, and consequently the labor is a great addition of the charge of preparing the hemp for a market, it might be great, great saving to the farmers in any town or place where much hemp may be produced to build a mill to do the work. And he included a plan for the construction and operation of such a mill. While there were a few hemp mills in Chester County in the second half of the 18th century, most residents would not have had access to them and would have done their flax and hemp dressing by hand. Interestingly, hemp production may have been more pervasive in Virginia than in Chester County, especially in the last eight, third of the 18th century and during the American Revolution, partly because hemp was the raw material for rope and sail making and a number of rope walks sprang up in Virginia to provide the needed cordage for local ship, shipbuilding when trade with Britain was curtailed. I should note here that despite some similarities between Chester County and rural Virginia, the labor systems were quite different. Chester County was originally settled by Quakers and early on immigrants of all nationalities tended to migrate to this region as families. They often came in groups, were relatively well off and became landowners. Subsequent waves of immigration tended to consist of single and less affluent people. And over the 18th century, a system of labor evolved that accommodated the region's market agriculture, 
and craft production in the form of indentured servants and later wage laborers, along with a very small number of slaves. I should mention here that the slave system was not well suited to the rhythms of seasonal agriculture with its fluid labor, labor requirements and slavery never really took hold on a large scale in the region. Thus, while the hemp mills of Virginia used much more slave labor, those in Chester County would have preferred to employ seasonal contractual workers, some of whom were specialized at the work as indicated uh, in the county newspapers and tax lists. These flax or hemp dressers may have worked in mills, but many would have operated as independent, often itinerant artisans, perhaps even with their own equipment. A farmer would have hired such a person or even someone who was not a specialist to live with his family for a period of months to work up the flax, though some, also sold, uh, farm, some farmers also sold their flax undressed. Unlike flax and hemp, American grown wool did not figure directly in the Atlantic trade, partly because it was generally a pretty uneven quality. Not until the end of the 18th century did farmers attempt to improve the local wool supply because earlier the sheep were almost more important for uses other than fiber. For example, they provided manure to fertilize crop and were an important food source. Poor quality wool could be used for mattress stuffing. Hat makers felted unspun wool in the hats they made. And sheepskin was used for parchment and artisans' aprons. Thus, many farmers might have kept sheep even if there, were little, there was little or no cloth making. And this chart shows that a lot more households had sheep than those with wool fiber. And it's interesting to note that as with flax, close to half of the household had neither sheep nor fiber, indicating that many rural residents did not have the wherewithal to make their own wool textiles. Regardless of the uneven quality of the wool, it was used for textile production, and though less labor intensive than flax and hemp, sheep husbandry and wool processing also had to be incorporated into the busy agricultural season. One of the reasons for the mediocre quality of the fiber was because sheep often roamed freely, accumulating dirt and debris in the fleece, making it challenging to clean. Nevertheless, when cold weather rendered grazing impossible, the sheep had to be rounded up, fed, and sheltered. Winter was also the time of lambing, and in the spring, fleece had to be shorn off. Pennsylvania farmers usually sheared the sheep in late May, about a week after cleaning them in a stream and putting them in a pasture to dry. And they either purchased the iron shears required for this work from a local blacksmith or bought English shears from a local merchant. According to one sheep expert, shearing was men's work and was, quote, the most arduous and dirty of all the animal husbandry tasks. But a proficient shearer could clip up to about 40 sheep per day. Given that only about 10% of the household in the county owned shears, and only about half of them actually had a few sheep, the, the average number of sheep being about 14, uh, per house per farm over the 18th century, that then likely a small group of skilled men moved around the county uh, shearing for wages. Once removed, the wool had to be sorted into its varying qualities, fine for inner clothing, coarse for outerwear, and some household textiles um, were also using finer wool. Then it had to be washed again before it was picked to open up the fibers and remove any last vestiges of debris. Work performed by women, some of whom did the work for pay as well as for their own households and their children often assisted them. By the beginning of the 19th century, this time consuming work could be done in a local mill. 
And depending on the final use of the wool, dyeing might occur at this stage. And in Pennsylvania, there were numerous professional male dyers who either worked with a cloth fuller, a little more later at his mill, or combined fulling and dyeing in their own establishment, which is not to say there was no home dyeing going on, but with the availability of professionals, people with access to the service would have used it. Dyeing in the wool, dyeing in the wool, produced a very color fast yarn and allowed several hues to be blended together. And then, as with flax, the wool fibers had to be aligned in order to spin a smooth and consistent yarn with wool combs or cards. Carding produced woolen yarn and wool combs were used for worsted, but generally the quality of the American wool was best suited for carding, though some wool combing did occur. Cards were used in pairs to brush the wool until the fibers ran parallel. They consisted of a wood slab with a handle to which was attached a piece of leather inset with tight rows of bent wire. Until the creation of carding mills in the very late 18th century, women and children performed the work, often in the evening when they finished their other jobs. According to one uh, 18th century commentator, quote, every housewife keeps a quantity of these cards by her to employ her family in the evening when they have nothing to do out of doors. Not only did women perform and supervise the carding of their own family's wool, but some also hired themselves out to do the work for others. While wool cards seemed to be simple implements, the need for specialized wire made it difficult for farmers to make their own. And besides, they had to be replaced regularly since they wore out after processing about 40 pounds of wool. As a result, most people bought imported cards from local merchants, which were available in quantity, even from the early years of settlement. Wool and flax processing did not change much until the end of the 18th century, when several factors converged to modify the work, triggered by advancing technologies and the desire to create national industries. The invention of the cotton gin in 1794 permitted the efficient removal of seed from the cotton fiber, with the result that Southern cotton soon began to replace the labor intensive production of flax in all regions. Farmers also began to experiment with more careful sheep breeding to improve the quality of local wool, importing Spanish Merino sheep for this purpose. Thus, by 1820, American fiber had undergone a significant transformation. But it was the early water powered carding machines that began to move the cloth production out of the home and into the factory, thereby removing one of rural women's most onerous tasks. By the first decade of the 19th century, carding mills dotted the countryside as grist and fulling mill operators added carding to their repertoire. But mechanical carding machines required a better quality of wool and local sheep bred with the imported merino sheep meant that by the 1830s, there was an American animal with a fleece suitable for the new carding machinery and for the ultimate production of medium and low quality cloth for the American market. Once the fiber was fully processed, it was ready to be spun into yarn. Spinning involves the creation of a long continuous strand by twisting the heckled flax or carded wool fibers into yarn. This is most simply accomplished by a spindle. Adding a drive wheel, a belt and some pulleys speeds up the process. Both flax and wool could be spun on a generic wheel, but many people had specialized wheels for each fiber. The long flax fibers did not require as much twist as wool, so flax wheels had a relatively small diameter and their flyer and bobbin mechanism driven by a foot treadle allowed the spinner to sit to work because the fiber was simultaneously spun and wound onto a bobbin. 
flax wheels often had an attachment called a distaff to keep the long filaments in place, though some spinners might have used a freestanding distaff or one they tucked under their arm. A proficient spinner could produce about uh, the two pounds of flax needed to make a coarse shirt in about five days and much longer to make a fine quality shirt. Wool fiber needed more twist and the large wool wheels took up a lot more space in the home as the weaver walked backward to twist the yarn and forward to wind it onto the spindle. Many women would have interspersed their spinning with other household duties, so it could take quite a while to spin the eight pounds of yarn needed to make a blanket. Working constantly, it could take up to a week. In spite of the fact that the wool wheels occupied more space in the home, Chester County households had more wool wheels than those for flax. I should know, however, that many households did not specify what kind of wheel they had using the generic term spinning wheel, which could have spun either flax or wool. So a much higher percentage had at least one wheel. As you can see from this chart at its peak, between 1770 and 1790, close to 70% of farm households had the ability to spin some of the yarn they needed. In addition to wheels, spinners needed several other devices uh, to, uh, to process their uh, yarn. Reels are winding devices that allowed the sp spun yarn to be wound off the spindle onto skeins, into skeins for weighing and measuring to determine the value if the yarn was to be sold or for quantity. These could be very simple as in the handheld nitty knotty, which you can see in use on the left. Far more complex reels, sometimes called click or clock reels, incorporated a counter that kept track of the length of yarn in a skein, which was critical information if it was to be used for a piece of cloth. Um, knitting didn't, it didn't matter how much, um, how many yards of yarn in the skein. And finally, a swift was an unwinding implement that held the skein while it was unwound into a ball for knitting, for example, or onto spools for weaving. Spinning wheels were not simple devices that farmers could have made themselves. Originally, many people may have bought, brought this tool with them from the old world. But very early on in Pennsylvania, they could buy them from specialized spinning wheel makers. Other skill, skilled woodworkers like joiners, cabinet makers, or chair makers also constructed them. And these artisans could acquire the needed metal parts from an ironmonger, blacksmith, or merchant. Well cared for, spinning equipment could last a very long time and was handed down through generations. Men bequeathed the tools to their wives and women left them to several relative, to female relatives, friends, servants, or slaves. For example, in 1794, one woman left to her slaves, Dinah and Betty, quote, each a spinning wheel and the reel and a big wheel between them. Spinning was women's work in the pre-industrial Western world and one is the, was one of the core components of, of female training and culture transmitted from generation to generation. Even some of the terminology reflects the gendered nature of spinning. Most obvious is the distaff that holds the flax for spinning, a word now associated with the women's, woman's side of the family, and the terminology for the spindle and bobbin mechanism of the, of the spinning wheel also related to women. The uprights that held it were called the maidens and the entire unit was called the mother of all. Most commonly in Chester County, women learned to spin from their mothers, but some young women apprenticed with a skilled sp spinner from outside their families. And once trained, they spun for their own use and or for wages, whether they were married or single. <clears throat> 
By 1760, the use of bound labor in the far, form of servants and slaves declined, not because there was a decreased demand for labor, but because the workforce had changed. By then, there was an increased availability of locally born free workers prepared to work on a short-term basis, thereby creating a more elastic workforce. Spinners were part of this transformation. Some women went into the homes of others for a period of time to spin using their equipment, while others sold yarn they spun at home using fiber produced on their own farms, perhaps, or purchased from others or provided by their customers. Married women who earned money with their spinning skills used it to pay for goods like agricultural products or for services such as weaving or cloth finishing. If single women did not have to contribute directly to household finances, they tended to spend their money on finery for themselves. Even though some women receive special training as spinners and some spun for pay, in general through the, throughout the 18th century, spinning was regarded as a household task that most rural women did interspersed with their domestic activities. At the end of the century, however, this began to change because spinning was so labor intensive and it took anywhere from six to 12 full-time spinners to provide enough yarn to keep one loom going. Throughout the 18th century, there were constant attempts to speed up the work. In this slide, you can see some of those attempts. A two-handed wheel doubled the output of a single spinner. A spinning jenny operator could originally spin eight strands at a time and eventually up to 80. And spinning mules meant that a single male, sp male spinner, um, and it had to be a male because the mules were very heavy and had to be pushed back and forth, but that person could operate hundreds of spindles. By the 1830s, Water-powered spinning mills eliminated the need for women to do this time-consuming work in many American communities. And with the exception of um, newly opened frontier societies, um, spinning equipment, a particularly specialty wheels, once the center of central importance, were either discarded, sold, or became so irrelevant they were no longer listed in inventories or they'd move from a central place in the kitchen to the attic or to the barn. This decline was even more pronounced in New England, the home of some of the earliest textile mills than in Pennsylvania. And as business historian Victor S. Clark observed in 1929, quote, the short period between 1810 and 1830 saw the center of gravity of textiles shift from the fireside to the factory. While spinning, spinning was women's domestic work, in Chester County, cloth weaving was a different story. The transformation of yarn into a finished textile demanded higher levels of skill and training than the preceding stages and a far larger outlay of resources for equipment. In 18th century Pennsylvania, because weaving was largely done by professionals who were also farmers, the work was likely done during lulls in the agricultural season. It's important to remember that Chester County was primarily an economy in which most residents engaged in market agriculture. That is producing a surplus of goods for sale on a local, national and international level but many households also combined a craft skill along with their farming. Small scale cloth manufacture was established very early on in the late 17th century as migrants who had been weavers in Europe reestablished their craft soon after settling in Pennsylvania. Interestingly, the scale of cloth making of the early years grew little over the 18th century in proportion to the population. And you can see from this chart that fewer than 
of the inventoried households ever possessed the tools, in particular a loom, needed to make the cloth, needed to make cloth, and weavers comprised fewer than 2% of the designated occupations in the county. As mentioned, it took six to 12 spinners to provide yarn for a single loom. And viewed from this perspective, the number of weavers in Chester County may have been determined in part by the community's ability to provide the raw material they needed. This chart shows throughout, that throughout the 18th century, there were about 12 spinning wheels for every loom with the highest ratio in the years immediately preceding the revolution, and perhaps in an attempt to increase domestic cloth manufacture due to the conflict with Great Britain and the resulting dearth of consumer goods that ensued. These ratios suggest, however, that the relative stability of textile, over the, uh, textile production over the period and the inability of most families to make their own cloth. Fabrics such as this 18th century linen bed hanging that are evenly constructed and attractively designed require much equipment, skill, and stamina to make. In addition to the reels I mentioned for winding and swifts for unwinding, a weaver needed a lot of equipment in addition to a loom in order to operate on a commercial basis. Regardless of pattern or design, any woven cloth consists of the basic elements of interlocking strands of warp, which are the longitudinal threads placed on the loom, and the weft threads that interlock horizontally with the warp carried across it with the shuttle. Not only, uh, not only do weavers need a great deal of training to make anything but the plainest cloth, they also require numerous specialized tools and the space to store and use them. So I'll go through some of these uh, quickly. A specialized wheel wound the spools for the warp threads that were put on a spool rack to unwind as the warp was made. The warp threads were pulled off the spools and wound onto a warping board, which you can see on the left. It's also called a frame uh, that had pegs at measured intervals to hold the warp ends in sequence. Or uh, one could use um, a labor saving uh, revolving warping mill, and that would also uh, speed up the process, especially if one was production weaving and weaving large quantities of cloth. For the weft, weavers needed a quilling wheel for winding it onto quills or bobbins that were placed into the shuttles that carried the web back and forth across the warp. They also needed reeds made out of reed, cane, pitch, tar, and twine that determine the spacing of the warp threads and the fineness of the cloth. Looms, of course, are the devices on which weavers made their cloth and their size and construction depended on the kind of textile made on it. Most of the looms in Pennsylvania were large wooden frames and the breadth was usually restricted by the weaver's arm width in terms of his ability to throw and catch the shuttle. German style looms were often of heavier construction than the British, perhaps reflecting the fact that many German cloth workers emigrated from linen producing areas that required sturdier looms than those used most commonly for the wool weaving practiced by many British artisans. Like spinning, weaving skills and often the tools were passed through generations of a family as illustrated by this family tree that I was able to construct showing that every generation from the 17th century straight through to the mid 19th century were involved in cloth making. In fact, the last generation shown on the chart, Joseph Eldridge and his sons continued the tradition of their 18th century forebears. They were weaving first in their own workshop, largely doing bespoke work for their customers, 
until the 1830, so until 1813. And this image of a property deed shows the separate weaver's shop in which many of the professional weavers would have plied their trade. Eldridge was one of the entrepreneurial weavers who along with uh, some fulling mill owners or fullers of the early 19th century who took advantage of the new technologies when he bought a local fulling mill, which he turned into a small integrated woolen factory where he and his sons carded fiber, spun yarn and wove and finished cloth until Joseph's death in 1845 when his sons took it over. This slide shows what Eldridge's mill might have looked like and suggests the increased speed and scale at which he could weave with a water powered mechanical loom and with the added capacity of a spinning mule to operate quantities, uh, to, sorry, to produce quantities of his own yarn, he was no longer dependent on his customers to provide his raw materials. And rather than having to take his cloth to a fuller to be finished, he could do it himself. These small integrated woolen mills meant that weavers who like Joseph Eldridge had for most of the 18th century worked on a bespoke basis weaving to order, now could weave stocks of cloth that they could sell, frequently advertising their wares in local newspapers. Most 18th century Pennsylvania weavers operated on a commercial basis, had more than one loom and hired people to help them with the work. Given the labor intensity of hand textile production and the fact that it had to be integrated with farming, artisans needed access to a flexible but skilled labor force. It took time to acquire the knowledge needed to make cloth and even more to make it suitable for sale. In, the 18th, in 18th century Pennsylvania, the two most common ways to learn the craft were through a legally recognized apprenticeship by working with a skilled family member, as in the case with Joseph Eldridge and his sons, um, or a skilled, a skilled weaver. An apprentice would be able to assist his master until he had sufficient training to take over much of the work. Early on, men who arrived in the province had been weavers in Europe and could be uh, acquired as indentured servants. Later, young, single, skilled artisans might live in the household of a weaver or weaver farmer and using their employer's equipment, weave for pay. There were other forms of contractual labor that a weaver might hire, thereby increasing his cloth output and expanding his agricultural operations because sometimes these people worked at both that they hired. But what did these commercial weavers make? 18th century Chester County homes contained a wide variety of cloth items, much of it bedding. They also had table linens, personal items like handkerchiefs and clothing, and farm-related textiles like bags, sacks, winnowing cloths, and wagon covers. As I said, most people who patronized a local weaver took their spun yarn to him and paid him to make what they needed. Some inventories listed yarn that was actually designated for specific items. So for example, I saw things like linen for bags, flax for 80 yards of linen, woolen and linen for coverlets, wool for flannel and blankets, and tow, which is coarse linen, for checked fabric. The more preparation a person could do prior to giving it to a weaver, the less the cost of the finished cloth. Some people might have dyed small amounts of yarn themselves or paid a professional dyer to do it for them. Weavers could also uh, do the dyeing or they took it to a dyer on behalf of their clients. Though a few people even made their own warps to cut costs, it was generally more efficient for the weaver to do those things for them. Based on an analysis of their account books, 
Chester County weavers did not specialize in any particular item. Rather, they wove a wide variety of both plain and complex cloth, and they worked in both linen and wool, though they used a lot more, um, they produced a lot more linen. Among their products were coarse and fine linen, plain checked and striped tow, plain and striped linsey, which was wool and linen cloth with sometimes up to four colors. And the more colors in a cloth, the higher the cost. Bagging, bed ticking, blankets, flannel and drugget, which is a coarse cloth of linen or cotton warp and a wool weft. Camlet, which was a fine wool cloth, shirting, carpet, handkerchiefs, and coverlets. All of those things were listed in these weavers account books I looked at. Though the Chester County weavers had the skills and equipment to manufacture a wide variety of plain and patterned coarse and fine textiles, their output met only part of local consumer demand. In terms of clothing, for example, many of the garments worn by rural inhabitants were made of simple and durable wool, worsted, linen, or mixed fabrics that could have consisted of a combination of locally made and imported fabric, perhaps as in this image, combining a skirt or petticoat made from fabric commissioned from a weaver and a top, here a short gown, made of imported British printed cotton. By the early 19th century, Manchester cottons uh, English Manchester cottons using raw material from our southern U.S. were imported all over the world and the United States was a huge market. But in addition to their simpler apparel, Chester County women owned garments of various types of silk, chintz, calico, fine broadcloth, cambric, and muslin, while men had clothes of velvet, fine linen, Marseilles, which is a white quilted cotton, and silk, materials that were part of the growing global trade involving Europe, Britain, and Asia. Nor was it necessary for Chester County residents to travel to a city like Philadelphia to produce their imported goods. An analysis from local retailers between 1729 and 1773 demonstrates that less than 20% of their shop goods might have been uh, made from local weavers or more likely was imported cloth that resembled that that was locally made. Access to relatively cheap foreign cloth combined with the labor intensity of weaving made imported material attractive to many rural consumers. To conclude, the story of textile production in Chester County compels us to revise traditional and sometimes entrenched views of agriculture, craft, and industry in early America. In this region, textile work was gendered. For the most part, women spun and men wove, and weavers operated on a custom-ordered basis using yarn provided by their customers. Raw material, however, was always in limited supply. And, um, and, and of mediocre quality. Moreover, rural residents, like their urban counterparts, wanted to own imported luxurious clothing and fabric furnishings to enhance their comfort and have visible indicators of their prosperity. The stable agricultural orientation of Chester County, the seasonal nature of craft work, and the availability of imported cloth were all factors curtailing the growth of textile manufacture in the region. This was a community that was deeply engaged in the Atlantic economy with no need to provide for all its own cloth needs. Not until the 1790s do we see change when weavers began to have access to more and better raw materials and when they could obtain yarn first from local mills and then from New England mills and later established their own small integrated factories. So I hope this overview of textile production in one region highlights the importance of understanding the social, cultural, and economic forces that created remarkably different 
regional economies within the broad context of early North America. And with that, I thank you. And I will stop sharing my screen. Well, thank you so much. That was really interesting. And uh, I really appreciate how you broke down the different fibers and the different processes that all um, are involved with this very laborious <laughs> task. I mean, something today we go to a shop and we spend $25 for a t-shirt or a shirt. And I mean, the time that used to go into textile production is just incredible. Um, it is, it's phenomenal because um, if you look at, you know, with all the quantification I did, tech, it, it, most people, their largest um, portion of their, of their value of their goods were, were in textile goods. Um, cloth was extremely important and you can also see because of its value, why it was also an important indicator of status. Um, yeah. So if you had extra, if you could dress in expensive clothing, you could afford to buy it. Um, and if you didn't have to wear homespun, that was also an indicator of your status. So um, it was it was really, uh, we do forget uh, since the Industrial Revolution that, you know, first of all, textiles drove the Industrial Revolution. And secondly, once they became, um, you know, easily and quickly producible in quantity by the factories, um, we just stopped doing it. Mm, yeah, I'm going to use this opportunity here to promote the museum. If any of you are in the area of Stan, Virginia, please come and uh, come to the Frontier Culture Museum. Textile um, interpretation is um, a very, very important part of our historical demonstrations that we do here. And we have really talented interpreters who are able to shear the sheeps, for example. We're getting ready to do that next week, by the way. So. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely important, not just in America in the American context, but as you said, also in the European countries mm -hmm. as well. So and I should mention um, some of the slides in there. The the um, pond reading for the flax was actually uh, from a project that was done at uh, your at the uh, Frontier Museum, and uh, it was so were some of the some so was some of the equipment. So. I know clearly mm -hmm. it, it's amazing that how long this how, how long the material survived the, the tools and equipment um, yeah. even if people didn't know how to use them or what they were for anymore they saved them yeah yeah if any of our viewers have additional questions for you what's the best way for them to contact you they could uh, get in touch with me um, through my email uh, and I can give it to you here or you can um, let uh, it's a dot hood at utoronto.ca. Perfect. And we'll make sure we also include that at the bottom of um, the, the video as well. So um, Adrian, thank you so much. I re really appreciate you breaking the various aspects of early American textile production down for us. And I want to thank you, all the viewers who have um, decided to join us again. Um, it's, we really appreciate um, you coming back and watching these videos. Please let us know how you're doing. Um, please send us a message on um, Facebook or um, on our uh, visitor center um, website, which you can find on our website. Um, also, I would like to thank the American Frontier Culture Foundation for their ongoing support of our lecture series. And if you'd like to support programs like this free lecture series, um, please consider making a contribution to our, um, to the foundation and you can find the donate button on the website on the lower left corner. So with that, thank you very much. And I hope to see you in person at the Frontier Culture Museum at some point. Good luck with your sheep shearing. Thank you.